Today, I want to talk to you about JSDoc and TypeScript and how you can leverage JSDoc annotations within your code in order to give you some of the benefits of TypeScript. But this is still in regular JavaScript, so you're not going to have to change anything about the language that you're writing. You're simply going to be able to, at the end of this video, add some annotations to your code that will allow the compiler to better understand what objects should be what type. And you'll see in some situations that's actually very, very useful where currently you don't get code completion. You would once you added this little bit of annotation to your code. And you'll also be able to catch more errors. You'll be able to better describe for tooltips what your code is doing. So this is going to be a very short video. I'm going to show you some of what I think are the most impactful things you can do with JS stock within Velo. And of course, there are going to be many more resources linked down below. So go check that out if you want longer form videos and some other documentation as well. So let's just jump into it. First, what you can see here is that we have a very simple line of code where we've declaring a string and giving it a value that is a string. So this variable itself doesn't actually need any sort of JS doc annotation, because if I were to take this annotation, which these annotations all look like this, uh, they do not start with a single line comment. They need multi-line comments. That doesn't need you, mean you need to put them on multi-lines, but a multi-line comment in JavaScript, if you're unaware, starts with a slash and two stars and ends with a star and a, and a slash. So that's a multi-line comment. And that's part of the JS stock format. So you'll need to use those when going through this. But like I mentioned, if I comment out this line, nothing really changes because here the compiler already knows that only string is going to be a string because that's what it was assigned as when, when we first defined it. So obviously if I were to go only string and try to assign it as a number, the compiler is going to have an issue whether or not I've defined JS doc. This is just to get you a little bit situated with kind of what we're talking about here with regards to types. Now that's a situation where you do not need JS doc. Uh, it will not benefit you. But a similar situation, and this isn't something you would always do, but it shows you the power of being able to tell the compiler what your code is intended to do or what types your code is intended to have. If you come down here, you'll notice and we can even just remove this for better clarity, that we have a variable called number or string. And if we have a valid reason for this, we'll try to assign it as a two, and that's what we want it to start as, but later we want to change it to a string. Of course, then the, the type checker comes in and says, hey, this string cannot be assigned to type number. I've seen that this is a number. Uh, please go assign another variable. Normally that is what you would do. But if you had a use case for this, what you could do is you can actually tell the compiler, actually, I want this variable to be a type of either a number or a string or something else. You could even add something fun like w.button, which would tell it, hey, I want this to be any one of these three things, a number, a string, or, uh, or an actual button element. Obviously, this is just for example purposes, but that's the that's the power that you have here. You could even say, hey, you know, I want this thing to be of these types, and then the compiler can go ahead and make sure it's of those types and not end up being any of those other types. We also have another type here uh, where you can specify star, and that would make it any type. So it could be a number or a string, or it could be any sort of object as well. So that's just the basic rundown of how this works in general. But now that was a very basic example. So let's go and tell the interpreter something more useful about our code. And specifically, we're going to talk about what happens when we're dealing with public files. Now, if you've dealt with public files before, one thing you might notice about them is that they don't have any typing information on the things you want to use. So for example, if I had, I forget what I called my button. I called it my button, of course I did. If I had a button that I wanted to work with, 
in this code and I do a dot, the, it doesn't know anything about what that object is. On, if I come back over to home and I try to do something like that and I do dot, it knows exactly what this object is and everything that this object can do so I get all this nice completion. So I would really like when writing my code to have that type of completion. So one thing you would do normally when writing public files is you wouldn't exactly refer to a specific, uh, a specific element. What you will want to do is you will want to pass in elements as arguments. Uh, this is a way to also keep your code a little more maintainable. So for example, if my button ever was renamed um, to something else, I would get highlighting here saying that this object doesn't exist in home, but if I had had my button over here, I wouldn't. So that's why I'm doing this particular approach. That part wasn't specifically about JS doc, but it goes to demonstrate that when you write code, if you do it the right maintainable way, other things become easier. And one thing that becomes easier here is that we can actually go ahead and tell JS doc a little bit about our code. So what you'll see I have defined here is I have a description at the top that says what this function does. I say what parameters this function takes and what their types are. So that's parameter of type w.button and its name is button. And you can see the code highlighting there showing me exactly what we're talking about, showing exactly what I'm talking about. And then also what this function returns and it returns void. It doesn't return anything. So that does a few things. For the second point, for the parameters, what it does is it gives us type completion. So if I were to simply remove this little bit of code and I came down here to button and I type button dot, I don't get anything just like before when I paste it in the object. But now when I have that parameter defined and I come down and I type button dot, uh, the interpreter knows exactly what this button does and my life is made a lot easier because now if I need to do something else with it, I can just hit tab and complete it. And I can also see at a glance everything I can do with this object. And so that is great. And what this, of course, does is it disables the button and gives a visual indication that it is off. So if I were to come back to my code here and I start and I go ahead and I import disable button up here and then I start using it, it actually tells me, oh, disables a button and gives a visual indication that it's off. And it takes a parameter button and it doesn't return anything it actually returns void. So that is great to see. <clears throat> and that is one of the main benefits of using JS doc and adding these types to your code is that you essentially, by telling the compiler a little bit, it gives you a lot of help. And then one final thing is that when defining return types, you can do much more complex types too. So for example, if I had a string, um, and this also works when defining a type itself, I can type, for example, string like this, and then I can go ahead and return something like string if this function did such a thing. Or if this function was asynchronous, I could go ahead and make it asynchronous. And then of course we see now that I've made the function asynchronous, I'll get a warning like, hey, this return type is not asynchronous. Um, one of these things needs to be fixed. Either this function isn't asynchronous or you need to fix the return type. So that's a great little bit of information to get from your interpreter. And then of course we can do things like, for example, it's a promise that contains a string. You would write it like that uh, anytime you're doing an asynchronous function. And yeah, that's basically it. That's kind of how JS doc works within Velo and how you can use it to make your life quite a bit easier. So yeah, that's what I wanted to cover today. There's a whole bunch of links down below that you can go check out and further your learning on this topic. 
Uh, there's a video there from my colleague Joshua, who's done a great roundtable a few months ago on TypeScript and JS stuck within Velo. It's much longer form, so check that out to learn quite a bit more about it. Uh, we actually ho host round tables every month at the end of the month. So if you are interested in those, hop into our Discord and all the information will be there on how you can attend and learn all sorts of different topics about Velo. I've also got a link down below from uh, Shunia, who is one of Wix's engineers, and that's the handle he goes by. But essentially, he posts a bunch of blog posts on all sorts of Velo topics, one of course being JS doc. So Again, another great resource. Also has some links to some JS doc cheat sheets that are always good to keep up whenever you're writing these annotations in your code. And yeah, that's basically it. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you again next time. Gotcha. All right, bye. Peace.